This week on Writers Inc. When I started writing, you know, my brother was already established and I wanted to make sure that if I succeeded at all, you know, it was on on my own, you know, for, on my own merit. And so when I started out, um, he was using a pen name. I was using a different pen name. We had different agents. We had different publishers. I, I initially wanted there to be no connection between us. And so part of that was making sure that when I wrote anything, it didn't sound like what he wrote. And so I spent all of those years desperately trying not to sound anything like him. And so it was a big, a big change, you know, all of a sudden to say, okay, you can, it's almost like taking the handbrake off. It would be like, you don't have to be constrained by that anymore. You can just write that way and not worry about, about whether it sounds like him. And in fact, the more it sounds like him, the better. J.K. Rowling was nearly homeless when she wrote the first Harry Potter book. Stephen King penned Carrie in a small desk wedged between a washer and dryer. James Patterson worked in advertising and famously crafted the Toys R Us theme song long before becoming an author. Join New York Times bestseller J.D. Barker and a panel of industry powerhouses as they pull back the curtain on some of the world's most prolific authors. Where do they start? What is their process? The biggest names in publishing all have origin stories, all have tips and secrets. What does it take to consistently top the bestseller lists and become a household name? Get your notepad out, school's in session. This is Writer's Inc. Hi, it's Christine Daigle. Patrick O'Donnell. Kevin Tomlinson. And I'm J.D. Barker. Welcome to Writer's Inc. Christine's got 12-foot ghost written on her her, her little video screen. I, I want to know what this means. Yeah, well, my, my son, my 15-year-old, is a Halloween nut and has um, twisted my arm to buy him a 12-foot ghost to put outside our house for Halloween. So I'm going to have a giant, <laughs> terrifying, lit up, ghost with a gross face outside of my house. Come on by. Have a look. <laughs> cool. My, my wife wants one of those really bad. And I know they have them at Home Depot because I like she's researched yeah. this. Um, yeah, for some reason, they, they, they won't they won't ship them. And I don't know why you have to go into the store to actually pick them up. Um, but our, our big thing is like, where are we going to put it? You know, like the, the other 11 months out of the year, right. like she's got closets full of, we've got 11 Christmas trees in our house that she puts up every year. She loves to decorate for these things. Um, but all that stuff takes up a lot of room. Um, right now, for, like I, I tend to cheat. So like I've got our, our porch lights and the lights around our house, they're like led and like I can control them with my phone. Um, so I just programmed them all to turn red for October. <sighs> Um, Ooh. you know, they turn like Christmas colors for Christmas, you know, but like that oh, takes yeah. me all of two seconds and I don't have to put anything away. Um, but we, you know, like our porch, like every year we get just a little bit more and more and more. Um, this year we added this really cool projector on our garage, like on the second floor window. So it looks like there's ghosts and skeletons yeah. and stuff dancing around in there. Um, but you know, I try to stick to the small stuff and I love the idea of the big giant ghost or skeleton, but I just, I've got no clue where to put I know. it. What is the deal yeah, with that yeah. though? Like well, suddenly everyone's building giant Halloween stuff. Like there's our home Depot has like these skeletons that are like 12 foot tall and people are putting them all, yeah. you know, like they're scaling their house or something. That's going to be me. I'm so excited. <laughs> when did this start? I don't remember this. JD's a horror writer. Every day should be Halloween for you, JD. You know, no one's going to think twice. Hey, I've got a 12 foot skeleton in the foyer. Uh, maybe I'll, I'll leave it out all year long. You know, like yeah, I, I can dress it up for Easter. We throw a Santa hat on it for Christmas yes. time. That, that yeah, thing's just going to get more that does that. and they more They actually scary. make Santa costumes. <laughs> yeah, they make Santa costumes for them so you can leave them out. I haven't seen bunny ears, but why not, right? Right. That's cool. There you go. Just <laughs> leave them out there. Oh, man. All right. Halloween coming up. Can't wait. Um, all right. JP is not here. Kevin, I guess you're playing oh, yeah. the part of JP. What's in all the right, news? Let me uh, bring that up. Sorry. Hold on. Uh, Tattered Cover Bookstore files for bankruptcy. Major independent bookstore Tattered Cover filed for Chapter 11 bankruptcy reorganization showing over $1 million in debt. The restructuring will provide up to $1 million in financing to obtain inventory, fill orders, and maintain operations as part of the restructuring, uh, Tattered Cover is closing three of its seven stores, cutting at least 27 staff positions. The company says that restructuring aims to put Tattered Cover on a smaller, more modern, and financially sustainable platform going forward. That's kind of sad. So I, I know the I know the name, um, and I've been to Colorado, but I've never actually been to one of their their stores. I've talked to them on the phone and things like that. Have you guys ever been to one? I've no. been to one, and uh, I think it was in uh, Colorado Springs. I was hanging out with uh, Nick Thacker. Yeah, are are they fairly big? 
Like it, if it's if it's what I'm remembering, it was pretty big. It was kind of Barnes and Noble level. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, that's kind of the vibe that I got. Like it's just a very large footprint, and you know, not really like a, a regular indie yeah. bookstore, but a much larger chain type store. Um, yeah, I, I'd hate to see them go. I mean, this is one of those names that is, is definitely thrown around. I know they've got a lot of influence in the in the book selling world. Um, they've been around for a very long time. Um, I'm hoping that they're going to be able to come out of this okay, and it's not some kind of precursor to you know a domino effect, and we see other stores shuttering. Um, but you you never know. I, I don't know. I didn't get a chance to read the actual article, so shame on me. But um, I don't know what was sort of causing this, like what what brought them to this point. Because I, I don't know if it's indicative of something that's going on in the industry. I know that a lot of the publishing industry is taking a hit. Uh, and uh, a lot of places, a lot of publishers are starting to kind of let people go and reduce positions and things like that. So I don't know if this is like a translation down from that. I don't really know. I, you know, there's fun, There's a, a line on here that JP actually left off the news story um, in, the, in the email that he sent us. Um, but they actually owe a lot of money related to gift cards. And oh, I don't wow. know if you remember, but a, a few years back, there was a, a some type of court ruling. Um, you know, if, if stores basically collected on gift cards and those gift cards weren't used, they had to deduct it in a certain way or they had to file it in a certain way. It had to hit the, hit the P&L in a particular way. Um, and, and this was a very significant number to these guys. Um, and, I, and I know it played a part in this. And, you know, that, that could be you know something else that we may see other other stores, you know, having to deal with that particular issue. Um, I, I, I need to go back and pull the facts on it because I, I think we're like kind of at the deadline, like, this is the year that they have to actually file whatever it was that came out of that ruling. So it's going to hit a lot of balance sheets. Yeah. Uh, go ahead, and, Christine. I'm sorry. Oh, I was just going to say, maybe we should look at uh, number three because they seem to be related. The Burns and Noble, Burns and Noble news piece and what this is going on. It does seem like people are going to smaller models. Like maybe it's harder to sustain the bigger bookstores yeah. for whatever well, reason. Every indie bookstore that I've gone to has been small. Like, you know, there's there's two in my general area. One's in the basement of like a shopping area. And the other one is like a storefront. I don't think it's, I don't know, maybe 5,000 square feet, probably a little bit more. But, you know, when I think of indie bookstore, I don't think of like a Barnes and Noble size um, store. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, they all have like, I'm in near Portsmouth, you know, right off the coast. Um, and, and we've got, I think five bookstores in Portsmouth, um, which seems crazy because it's a very, very small town. Like you can literally yeah. walk from one end to the other, you know, within probably an hour. Um, but we get so many tourists coming through, like mm -hmm. the foot traffic just is, is insane. And, and those stores are basically able to support themselves because of that. Um, but when you start getting into an environment, you know, like basically a normal town where that's just, isn't happening. Yeah. Um, you know, it's, it's a whole different ball game. All right. Next up, uh, Spotify super premium sub subscription details leak. That's a lot of S's. Uh, leak details reveal Spotify is <laughs> launching a high end subscription called super premium with lossless audio and ex exclusive features. Super premium will include 24 bit lossless audio, 30 hours of audiobook list listening and AI powered playlist based on text prompts. Super Premium will be priced at $19.99 per month, con uh, continuing premium options for families and duos, though an exact launch date is still unconfirmed. Spotify is doing a lot. They're doing a lot of stuff. Yeah, they are. They're coming for Audible for sure. <laughs> oh, yeah. You can see the crosshairs. <laughs> They're trying. This this is a pretty hefty price tag, though, right? Because Audible, I think, is is it $15.99, $14.99, something for, like, like that? For like their they lowest might even have a cheaper tier plan. plan yeah. yeah, for the low, like one credit a month. It started like um, around $10, right? $9.99, and it jumped up a little while ago. Yeah, it, it's you know it's it's like all these other ones. It just ticks up like a dollar every year. Right. And they keep squeezing what they, they can. Um, yeah, this is going to be a, an interesting thing to watch. I just, I honestly don't see something that's based on hours taking off. I, I just see that being a, a problem. It's, it's so much easier just to spend one credit yeah. per book and just know what you're getting rather than, you know, having to re up your account just to finish listening to a yeah. book. I think that might get old really quick. Um, I don't know that their content's going to be any different because they're getting books from the same place audible is, um, you know, and audible actually has the exclusive on a lot of stuff because mm -hmm. of the way they're, they're currently structured. Um, so unless that changes or Spotify finds some way to to combat that or you know make themselves just a little bit shinier than than audible, um, I don't know that this is attractive. Yeah. If you think about it though, this this actually kind of makes the shorter audio more attractive. Uh, that's one problem with Audible is that no one wants to spend a credit on a short, you know, short story or novella or something of that length 
because it feels like a waste of that credit. But if you've got 30 hours of audio each month and you're, you can listen to as many things as you want within that buffer, then uh, I could see a lot of people gravitating more towards short fiction. I can see that for sure. I can also see Audible coming up with a way to deal with short fiction. You know, maybe, maybe sure. somehow allowing some, yeah. some different plan based, based on that. And, and Audible also has. But they have to be incentivized to do that. And maybe this will incentivize them. <laughs> they will. I mean, that's one of the nice things that comes out of this, right? That, that competition just spurs, yeah. spurs change. Yep. All right. Uh, this was alluded to earlier. Uh, maybe I should have read it second. But Barnes & Noble sets itself free. And who doesn't want a free Barnes & Noble? But Barnes & Noble is breaking from corporate branding norms by allowing local customization of store design as part of a back to basic strategy. CEO James Daunt embraces modular shelves, brighter interiors, and letting managers tailor locations to communities over consistency. Daunt believes in experimentation, even allowing a Florida store to change its name back to the acquired chain B. Dalton. Oh, sorry, that's, oh, wow. that's a win. Uh, the approach mm -hmm. echoes indie bookstores and aims to encourage browsing through branding experts. Uh, though branding experts say inconsistency could confuse consumers. I don't agree. I think this is one of those instances where what could be all that inconsistent? They're all bookstores. doesn't matter what they look like. Yeah, I honestly think this might hurt. I mean, I, 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 I'm on the fence on this because yeah. if I saw a B. Dalton, I would probably you know go across six lanes of traffic just to get over there just to see what was going on. Because right. I, I, miss, I miss B. Dalton and I forget what the other one was that was in all the shopping malls. Um, but you know, they all got gobbled up by, by Barnes and Noble over the years. Yeah. Um, the, the thing that gets me about this though, it, it, and I have the same problem with home Depot. Like if you walk into a home Depot right now, pretty much anywhere in the country, it's laid out you know, identical, you know, you know exactly where everything is, which is nice. You know, that there's a, a certain comfort factor to that, you know, exactly where to go in the store and Barnes and Noble today is kind of like that. Um, he's basically giving them free reign to change anything that they want, more or less, on the interior. Um, I think that's taking it a little bit too far. I really think they should have some type of standard footprint that is mimicked in every store and then maybe have a certain section of the store that can be dedicated towards local. Um, but if you get to the point where it's fragmented completely, you know, and every, every Barnes and Noble looks different from every other Barnes and Noble, I think that that might come back to bite them. I think though, okay, where Barnes and Noble is going to be different from say Home Depot is you go into Home Depot because you have a problem you're trying to solve and you want to get the answer as quickly as possible. But I, I would, I to totally make up a number. I would say 99% of people going into a Barnes and Noble or any bookstore are, are just there to browse to see what they discover. And I actually think that changing the format of these, these, uh, the storefronts isn't going to have much of an impact at all on that. And in fact, how much can you possibly change? Because they're still, they're not, it's not like they're going to get rid of the sci fi and fantasy section and call it something else. You know, it, those are all going to be there, just going to be a different, slightly different location, perhaps. Yeah. And I just wonder about like, is it smart? Um, you know, because a lot of readers love to support indie bookstores. So if it does say something like B. Dalton, are they more likely to go support? Does it give booksellers? more power to cater to their customers, to local tastes, yeah. to stock things that they know maybe are going to move. So I, I don't know. I think it's interesting. I think it'll be interesting to see what happens with this. And that yeah. other store I don't was know Walden if I'd be Books, happy about it. Walden Bookstore, yeah. Bookstore. Walden, yes. <laughs> I loved Walden's. Yeah, see, I, I tend to hit Barnes & Noble for you know two different, like what Kevin mentioned, you know, sometimes I'll go in there five times and I'll just browse the shelves and just kind of wander around in there. Other times I know exactly what I need to get. Yeah. You know, I park really fast, I run right in, you know, I want to be able to get in and get out. Um, other times I'm going there because I'm in a, you know some strange city and I just want to run in and sign my own books. And I kind of like the fact that I know where to find them, you know, pretty much in every Barnes & Noble. I don't want to, you know, I may not necessarily have the time to, to spend wandering around. Um, yeah, so there's there's you know there's good and bad. I'm sure the the good news is because of the people that are involved in the, you know this is a private equity firm. They are looking at every dollar of what's working and what's not. They're going to analyze the hell out of this, and they're going to know very quickly whether or not it's working, and they're going to tweak it to accommodate that that change. I I will throw. I'd like to throw this one last thing in because it's an idea that just hit me. Because if I were Don, one of the things I'd be looking for is. Uh, when you let all these stores go and build their own format, which of the formats are working the best? This would, this could just oh, end up yeah. being a test to say that format works really well. So let's try that on, on 
you know, 60% of our stores and see what it does. Yeah. And honestly, like they're, they're watching this very closely. They're, yeah. you know, the cameras that are in there aren't just watching, you know, to, to see if somebody is stealing something. They're monitoring how many people are hovering around every table. And I can guarantee at this point, there's a computer that's tabulating that data. They know how many people went over to the bargain rack every single day. They know how many people were over at the new release table. Um, you know, how much time was spent at each of those things. You know, when you walk into that store, those eyeballs are on you. Everything, every move you make is, is documented at this point. I'm just wondering if this is a last ditch kind of thing. I don't know what kind of financial shape they're in. You know, they've gone through a bunch of different uh, CEOs, et cetera. Are they throwing this against the wall to see if it sticks? Because they got nothing to lose. Why not give it a whirl? No, no, they're 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 actually they, they've been doing very well since the private equity firm took over. They, oh, okay. Yeah, they, they've been they've been creeping back up. Um, yeah, the same people re, they turned around Waterstones in, yeah. uh, mm-hmm. in the UK. They they know what they're doing. Yeah, because Barnes and Nobles was treading water for quite some time. Yeah, I do feel like you know if you have booksellers that are local, they do know what's what's wanted. I was um, this week at uh, an event with, sorry, school bell. Sorry about that, Jeff. Uh, with uh, Danny Kane and Josh Cook and and Dan Wells, who are all uh, booksellers or bookstore owners, and they are talking about the strategies that work, like which books are facing out, you know, yeah. um, sell more. Which books uh, booksellers get followings of people who will buy if they write something about it. And one of it was stack them high. If you want to sell a book, if you get twenty of them, people will just start buying it. So they'll be like, why are there twenty books? They must be popular. Why do they have so many? So there are strategies that work. And I'm sure Barnes and Nobles will be analyzing those things in different towns, seeing if they generalize or if local works better. So there you so- go, JD. Next time you go to Barnes and Noble, go grab every single copy of your book and stack it on that front table. It'll be sold out by the end of the hour. <laughs> Absolutely. Well, stack it 12 feet tall like <laughs> Christine's ghost. <laughs> <laughs> it's funny that you bring that up because I remember when when Patterson when he wrote that book with Bill Clinton, um, it came out and I I saw it at the local Walmart and there was a literally a pallet yeah. sitting in the middle of the aisle, wow. you know, like the plastic had basically just been torn off a you know a shipping pallet and the books were just stacked there, you know, probably a couple hundred of them or something, um, and people were just grabbing them like left and right, just walking by, you know, they were in there to buy clothes for their kids, but they saw a pallet of books sitting in the middle of the store and they started grabbing them. Um, I, I I don't want to speak to other conversations but yeah. that was not an accident yeah you know, there's some yeah. very very strong marketing dollars and ideas an behind behind that and and it's a very valid theory you see a pile of something like that you want one you know yeah because you want to be not, reading just, what's popular right that's popular i want to talk about my friends with it there's a million of them that must be the books you get yeah. right that works so that, yeah absolutely this episode is brought to you by autocrit One of the most value-packed memberships for any author, Autocrit brings you an amazing suite of tools that make it a breeze to plan, write, and edit your books all in one place. Autocrit takes you far above standard grammar checking or cookie cutter guidance. Instead, it's like having an experienced editor in your genre watching over your shoulder to help you deliver great writing that keeps your audience trapped in the story. You can even compare your writing style to more than 100 best-selling authors right down to the word level, so you can see what the best in the business do to keep their storytelling clean, clear, and crisp. Listeners of the Writers Inc. podcast can now take advantage of lifetime membership for one single fee. That's right. No renewal fees. Hi, this is JD Barker. I've used AutoCrit for years and not only has it improved my writing, but it's been a crucial tool with aspiring authors that I've mentored. Whether you're a seasoned pro or just beginning, it'll help you find your weak spots and weed them out. Give it a shot with your latest project. Trust me, your editor will thank you. Head to autocrit.com slash JD to get your lifetime membership. Big thanks to AutoCrit for sponsoring the show. All right. Very cool. Okay, JD, who's up this week? This week, we've got New York Times bestseller Andrew Child back. He's here to tell us about the latest Jack Reacher novel. It's called The Secret and releases October 24th. Here he is, Andrew Child. So you have a new book out, The Secret, which is the 28th Jack Reacher book, I believe. Is that right? That's right. It is. Yeah, it's the 28th overall, and it's the fourth that uh, I've worked on with my brother. Yeah. Do you want to tell us a little bit more about uh, what to expect from the book? Yeah, I mean, it was a book. We had so much fun writing this book. We 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 came up with an idea for an opening scene where a guy is lying in bed in hospital. He's had a massive heart attack. Nobody expected him to recover, but somehow he did. 
and he's kind of got used to being in hospital. He knows the routines. He knows the, the, the way everything works, except that one day he wakes up and finds two strange people in his room. And uh, before very much longer, he finds himself being thrown out of the window. <laughs> so, uh, you know, book doesn't start very well for him, but uh, hopefully, it's uh, it's a good, exciting beginning for uh, for for us and the readers. Yeah. Last time you were on the show, uh, you said that you usually have an idea that you build the story around. Was that the initial idea for this book? This man being thrown out of his hospital window. Yeah, it was. You know, we'd, we'd come across a few years ago, we'd come across a story about a bunch of people, kind of well-dressed, respectable-looking people being being found dead in peculiar circumstances. And um, that had just been intriguing us for, for quite a long time. So uh, we thought, yeah, we'll, u- we'll use that as the uh, as, a, as the seed that, that this, this book is going to grow out of. But um, what we decided to do was, rather than have it sort of open with lots and lots of people already dead, we thought it would be more fun to have only a couple of people dead and watch what happens to the other people who were on the on the list of people, you know, lined up to meet their fate, because, you know, kind of more fun to see what's happening to them and try and figure out who's doing it and why. Right. So lots of people dying in unusual ways in sequence. (laughs) That's great. So I'm curious about, um, without giving away too much, this idea that keeps coming up in the book that uh, you shouldn't underestimate women or that women are overlooked as a threat. Was that one of the initial ideas or did that come out in your writing process? Well, that came out as a result of the fact that there are really two... But there are two timelines in the book. You know, most of the events in the book take place in 1992, but they refer back to um, some things that happened in 1969. And so, you know, I've personally never written anything in anything historical before. You know, Um, my wife, Tasha, she writes historical fiction all the time. So she's used to the process that you have to go through to find out what the environment was like, what the, you know, what what sort of constraints there were for people in these previous time periods that might not apply to us now. So that's something I was trying to do. I was trying to think, okay, if you were opera, if you were living, if you were working in the late 1960s, what things would be different? And um, that was really where the kind of the constraints on the female characters came from, because, of course, career opportunities were different, um, sort of things that were accepted in terms of behavior and so on were different. So, you know, we we, we latched onto that and, and tried to use that um, as a way to inform what might motivate the characters and what might um uh, make what kind of activity is available what kind of activity is not available and use that as a sort of parameter for how these people might act how they might behave and how they might feel because you know if you're living in an environment where your that your um horizons are, are, are artificially restrained you know that that has to be that has to be frustrating so we tried to take all of that into account yeah and then you have one character who kind of gets stuck there through no fault of his own, but through threats, is stuck living in 1969 for quite a few years. Um, So was that a different process for you then? Did you have to do different kind of research or how did you approach that? Yeah, it was a different process because it's something that um, that we'd not done before, and it just made made us think in a different way. Um, You know, I think as as authors, you know, we're all used to putting ourselves in other characters' shoes, you know, saying, you know, what would it feel like if you were an assassin? What would it feel like if you were a spy? Um, And I've done that many times, but I've never really put myself in the shoes of, well, what if I was living at this time in the past where the sorts of things that I was allowed to do were different? you know and um but that made us that made us really think in a different way and so some of the research was different as uh, as as well you know we had um there was an aspect where we were talking about <clears throat> a suspicion came up about whether perhaps some characters had military training and now we take for granted that if you can join the army if you want whether you're a man or a woman but of course back in the 60s that was not the case in it, so we had to do quite a bit of research to find out which countries at that time allowed women into their armies what kind of roles were they allowed to perform what was the thought process behind 
those decisions. So um, yeah, there, there was a, there was there was quite a bit of extra historical digging we had to do. And did that take uh, mostly the form of like book and internet search, or did you use experts that you talked to, or? Yeah, it was mainly um, mainly books and internet because you know it's the kind of thing where you want to make sure that you're dealing with with the real facts and um, you know people's perceptions you know sometimes aren't all that reliable. So we wanted to make sure that we were dealing with um, really solid information. Nice. Well, I learned something from this book uh, about the difference between civilian and military ARs or uh, stealing low receivers from M16. So I'm curious about that. Where did you get? That detail from because that was just fascinating. Well, that was something that we 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 originally wrote about quite a long time ago because I think that with research, I think it falls into kind of two categories. There's the sort of detail research that you can do as you go when you're writing a book. So, you know, maybe you're writing about a particular kind of car. You can find out how big was its engine, what was its top speed, what, what was its naught to 60 time. That's that's not a problem. Those details you can you can pick up as you go. But the bigger research, you know, the things that actually form the foundations of the story, I find that you've got to really draw them from things that you've come across or learned just organically in the past because they take time to kind of ferment in the back of your mind and that particular thing that that you're referring to we we wanted to remind people because this was a, this book is a prequel so it, it's back when reacher is still in the army and so we were mindful that some people might not have read a prequel for a while. We might even have people that, that have never read one of the prequels. And so we needed a way to illustrate how Reacher worked when he was still a military investigator. What kind of cases was he involved in? What kind of process did he go through? You know, did he follow the rules? Did he cut corners? How intuitive he was? And so we needed something that we could we could show him working on. And I remember reading a thing back from, I think it was the first Gulf War. You know, that was a time when the American military was buying an enormous amount of new equipment. And of course, a lot of that new equipment replaces old equipment. So what happens to that old equipment? Where does it go? Who processes it? Who destroys it if it needs to be destroyed? Who reallocates it if it still has some life? And so um, it was something I remembered from that time that there was this opportunity for for um, things to go amiss. And so we had Reacher um, on the trail. You know, it, it wasn't designed to be a huge part of the story, really. It was something that was there to really just put Reacher in context of how he operated when he was still in the army. And so, yeah, that, that stuff about what may or may not happen to weapons, how they could or could not be adapted or abused um, came from something I read years ago. Nice. So I'm curious, you get most of your uh, research from reading. Do you use like law enforcement or soldiers or anyone like that to beta read your work for accuracy or is it all just on your shoulders? Yeah, I mean, we we, we have done a lot over the years and um you know, it's, it's, it's difficult because, you know, <clears throat> I, I I used to write books about detectives, as an example. And so I was friends with a couple of guys who'd been detectives. And when I, I, I started out thinking it's going to be great because we're going to be able to cull all kinds of, of really great information from their stories. But the thing is, a lot of the time, real life, it might not be all that exciting, you know. And yeah. a lot of <laughs> You know, a, a lot of the stories were in that situation, you know, criminals taking advantage of opportunities they came across. You know, they weren't criminal masterminds. They weren't plotting and scheming something really interesting. They just saw an opportunity and took it. And often when they got caught, it was because they made a stupid mistake. And I think that I always put myself in the shoes of the reader because, you know, all writers are readers first and foremost. And you have to ask yourself, what is satisfying to read? And it might not be something that is factually super accurate. It might be something that that involves a little bit more of the kind of cunning planning and, and, and preparation than you might get in the real world. So we always check stuff with people whenever we can to make sure that we're not saying things that are totally untrue or totally impossible. But we kind of try to blend that input from the real world 
with the stuff that we come up with from from the imaginary world and often you start with something real and then you riff from that you know you think okay that's what actually happened but what if it had been like this what if it had been like that and and try to come up with something that is still plausible but as is as interesting and as exciting as possible for the readers Right. And and of course, the Reacher books are all about Jack Reacher. Uh, and this is your fourth book, as you said. Um, I, I think as authors, like we explore aspects of ourselves and our characters in our books. Is that true for you? Is that something you find? Absolutely. And I think particularly with with Reacher, because the things that um, that make Reacher crazy, you know, the things that, you know, presses buttons that cause the red mist to descend those are absolutely things that for me and my brother you know they they exactly the things that set reacher off are the things that set us off and so you know what we try to do particularly when we're coming up with the villains in the books um is because we want to keep them relatable you know you don't want the kind of james bond style you know guy you know in a in a you know super high tech palace somewhere, you know, cackling with a albino cat on his lap, you know, you want something that people can relate to. And so it has to be the kind of thing that you absolutely recognize from your daily life, you know, somebody who is a bully, somebody who who rides roughshod over people without caring about what happens to them, you know, those are the things that get us annoyed. So those are the things that get Reacher annoyed. And is that what you enjoy, like exploring most uh, with Jack? Are there other aspects that you enjoy exploring through him? What do you enjoy most about writing the books? I mean, all of it is enjoyable, but I think that um, one place that we try to really focus on at the outset is making the villains um, relatable and believable and also at a reasonable scale because there's a, a thing we concept we came up with a few years ago that we call um villain inflation you know because imagine you have a book where you write that your your villain is going to try to detonate a nuclear bomb in the center of manhattan okay obviously he has to be stopped well if you want to up the ante for the next book, what do you do? Do you have two nuclear bombs in DC? And then do you have four nuclear bombs in LA? It gets out of control really, really quickly. So the villain has to be somebody visceral that the reader is going to despise and is going to look forward to Reacher taking down. But they have to be operating at a scale that is that is plausible. And so we always look for the kind of human connection, you know, what is it if it was in your somebody was in your life, you know, a friend and a acquaintance, a boss at work, something like that, what would really get your hackles up? And that's what we try to build into the into the villains. So that is something that we that we pay a lot of attention to. And aside from that, I think it's really just the kind of, it's almost like it's a sort of wish fulfillment in a way. You know, everybody has frustrations in their day-to-day life and things that they would wish they could put right, but they can't because you'd have to go to jail or you'd lose your job or you'd get divorced or something you know so you have to you know we you know you create this this alternative universe where reacher for however long you you, you spend reading the book reacher becomes your proxy and reacher can do those things that you wish you could do so yeah we have a lot of fun with you know you set up the villain to be this obnoxious character that you you hope that the reader is looking forward to seeing taken down and then you have reacher do it in a you know pretty dramatic way and um it's really fun to write. I just hope it's as much fun to read. Yeah. And I want to dig into what you just said there a bit more um, because Reacher is known for doing the right thing, right? He always tries to do the right thing, but he also does a lot of killing. (laughs) So how do you balance that so that the, the readers feel like the killings are justified or how do you craft the characters so the reader really feels like they need to get it? Well, you know, I think it's probably a combination of a couple of things. It's it's firstly making sure that the villain is sufficiently detestable. You know, it can't be somebody that's just done some minor infraction. It has to be somebody that is, you know, full on appalling. So the, the reader is rooting for that person to be taken down. And then for Reacher, he, you know, his whole existence is about doing the right thing. He, he He's physically incapable of walking away if he sees something wrong. It doesn't matter if it costs him. It doesn't matter if it hurts him. It doesn't matter what the consequences might be. He is compelled to right a wrong if he sees one. And I think that kind of 
clarity and purity is very very appealing we live in a you know a very complicated time there's so much so many gray areas that we have to navigate our way through i think having somebody that we can we can root for who is purely about the good and i mean we've all been frustrated by rules in our life haven't we you know and um petty you know bureaucratic things that stop you from doing what you feel that you need to do you know maybe they're um, top a little bit in Reach's case, you know, because they're not so much rules, they're more laws sometimes. But sometimes things like that stand in the way of doing the right thing. And Reacher does not let them stand in the way. He does the right thing regardless. And I think that, I think really fundamentally, a lot of people, most people want to do the right thing or would love to if only real life didn't get in the way. And so having someone like Reacher who can do the right thing kind of on their behalf is is really attractive. Yeah. And do you think with all your experience now, is that the most important thing? Um, do you think it's more important to be original or more important to give readers what they want? Or do you try to balance those kind of things? Yeah, I think that's a great question. And I, I think it has to be a balance because, you know, you, you don't want to do the same thing over and over. You don't want to revisit the same ground. You know, one of the Reacher books is even called Never Go Back, you know. So, you know, you don't want to to do that. And I, I, you know, coming into the series when I did, you know, I'd obviously read each book when it came out and I've been very careful to keep note of where Reacher has been, what kind of um, enemies he's encountered, what kind of scenarios he's had to escape from so that we don't repeat anything. So we want everything to feel new and to feel original, but with a degree of familiarity, because if you, you know, if you are parting with your hard earned money, to buy or reach a book. There's a there's a there's a contract there. There's an obligation for us to give the reader what they have a, a good reason to expect. And so, you know, we we want some of the detail and some of the action and some of the scenarios to be new and original. But fundamentally, you know, we know that people want Reacher being himself, defeating the bad guys, and coming out victorious. So, you know, it is a balance between providing everything, all the touchstones that people need and that keep them oriented and keep them satisfied, but with some twists and some surprises thrown in so that it seems fresh and it seems original at the same time. Yeah. And what do you think uh, readers expect from a Reacher book? Is it that always doing the right thing or do you think think there's more to it? I mean, that's a huge part of it. I think that um, when, um, you know, they're going to, we've tried to keep the the setting very different, you know, because by making Reacher rootless, it means that he can go anywhere and he can get involved in anything. You know, if you if you write a series about a homicide detective in a particular city, then you're pretty much fixed with the book's going to open with a murder in that city, you know, and we didn't want that. We wanted it so that Reacher can be involved in anything. So that gives us a lot of scope. And so we can exploit that scope, but within it, um, the other day I was talking with Lee and he he put it in a great way. He, he said it's a bit like, this is a little strange, I know, but he said it's a bit like if you watch the Olympics, the Winter Olympics, and you have the figure skating, right? People have to come up with these routines and they get marked for the technical merit and the artistic interpretation. And there are certain things that are required for them to include in their routines, right? But then the rest of it is up to them to come up with stuff which is new and surprising. And that's kind of like writing a book within a series, because there are certain things that you feel are required. The reacher, the reader needs reacher to come up against some terrible enemy, to be in jeopardy, um, to solve a puzzle that seems insurmountable at at the outset, and to come out victorious. You know, those are the things that you need. We're not going to have Reacher lose. We're not going to have Reacher unable to figure out the puzzle. You know, we're not going to have other people who are able to beat him up. None of that is going to happen. But we still need to do it in a way that, you know, you're surprised at the end and you think, oh, you know, I knew Reacher was going to succeed, but I didn't realize it would be that way, or I didn't realize that he would pull that rabbit out of the hat. So um, there is, there's, there's definitely a, it's a kind of a tightrope that you're on to make sure that you stick with what people want, but you, you still give them enough in the way of surprises and novelty to keep them coming back for more. So 
on your 28th book, how do you keep track of all that? Like settings and things that have happened, like how do you keep the continuity while trying new things? Yeah, I mean, unfortunately, it's it's not a very exciting answer. You know, when um, when Lee approached me and 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 asked if I would like to join him in writing the Reacher books, I went back and I reread all of them, and I made a monster spreadsheet, and I you know recorded all of those details. You know, down to which cars have been involved, which weapons have been involved, what kind of fights were involved, what locations, what were the villains doing, what was what what did they pretend to be doing versus what was their actual objective. So you know, I have this huge database that I can I can refer to because you know when I when I came on board, there were, you know, there were already 24 books. And so that is an awful lot of detail. So, so you know, Lee remembers nearly all of it, but then he wrote those. Um, you know, as a reader, you, you, you remember a little bit less. And so I wanted to really make sure that I wasn't accidentally straying into, um, into old ground. Nice. And so you have your spreadsheet so you can see what's been done. And you've been writing for a long time, your own books before you came on this. How do you keep the joy in coming up with new ideas for the next book. Well, I think it it, it just boils down to um, how you're wired, you know. And as you said, I've written <clears throat> some books with my brother. I wrote some other ones before, but it, m- decades before I had any concept that I wanted to be a writer, even as a little kid. I just always wanted to tell stories. That's all I ever wanted to do. And so I didn't realize when I was tiny that the, the, the kind of ultimate destination of telling stories was telling them by writing them down on paper and having them bound into books. I, I just wanted to tell stories to people all the time. And that's not changed. You know, you learn a little bit about the craft and you learn a little bit about how the industry works and you learn about deadlines and copy editors and proofreading and all of that kind of stuff, which is kind of essential procedural steps. But it all stems from the fact or the or the wit or the desire to tell stories. And that has never gone away. I hope it never will. Well, so I'm curious, um, doing your own work and then uh, writing with your brother, how do you think your solo voice is different than the Jack Reacher voice? That's a great, another great question. And, you know, In a way, I think it's probably all been influenced by Reacher because when I started writing, you know, my brother was already established and I wanted to make sure that if I succeeded at all, you know, it was on on my own, you know, on my own merit. And so when I started out, um, he was using a pen name. I was using a different pen name. We had different agents. We had different publishers. I I initially wanted there to be no connection between us. And so part of that was making sure that when I wrote anything, it didn't sound like what he wrote. And so I spent all of those years desperately trying not to sound anything like him. And so it was a big, a big change, you know, all of a sudden to say, okay, you can, it's almost like taking the handbrake off. It would be like, you don't have to be constrained by that anymore. You can just write the way you want, because naturally, I think we we do describe things the same way. We see things the same way. We think about things the same way. Um, and in our real lives, you know, we're very economical in the sense that we like, you know, minimal decoration in our homes. We like, you know, we don't like you know, fancy clothes, those kind of things. And that kind of shows in the kind of prose that you get in Reacher books. It's spare, it's 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 efficient, it's to the point. And so just I feel kind of, you know, released in a way that I can just write that way and not worry about, about whether it sounds like him. And in fact, if it sounds like the more it sounds like him, the better. Right. Excellent. So as we're recording, the first of September has just passed. So have you started a new Reacher book? We have indeed, yes. <laughs> yeah, because as you point out there, the 1st of September is is the significant day because um, all of the Reacher books have been started on the 1st of September because, uh, I don't know if you, you probably know already, but that's the day after uh, Lee Loss got fired from his previous job. So um, he sat down on the 1st of September all those years ago to start and we still do it. So yeah, the new one is underway. It's not very long yet, but it has started. And uh, that's a great feeling. Yeah, that's great news. Book 29, there'll be a 29th Reacher book. So that's fantastic. And as we're running out of time, I just have one final question. What would your advice be for someone who's going to write 
collaboratively for the first time? That is that is a really good question because um, when we started, we had no idea how to do it, none at all. You know, would. We'd both he'd obviously written more books than me, but we'd both been doing the job for quite a long time. We'd never done it with anybody else. We weren't really known for our, you know, ability to play well with others, and so we had no idea how to do it. And um, so I think the thing that we we came to understand is that what you've got to do is you've got to put all of your focus on the book that you're producing. You've got to try to put your own ego to one side and you've got to say, do the words on the page, do the job you want them to do. And the answer is either yes or no. Doesn't matter who wrote them. Doesn't matter if it was you or him. Doesn't matter what you were trying to achieve. It doesn't matter how great your ambition was or how worthy or how noble. The only thing that matters is if you were somebody who took that book at a bookstore or at a library, you open to that page, do the words work in the way that you, they're supposed to. And if they don't, then you throw them away and you come up with some new ones. It's all about making sure that the, the, the end result is the way that you want it to be. And you've got to forget about yourself or the other person in that process and just focus on, on getting the result. This episode is sponsored by the book marketing experts at Written Word Media. They know that marketing your book can be a challenge, and that's why they make marketing simple by providing quick, easy, and effective ways to promote your books. When you schedule a promotion with Written Word Media, your book is emailed to tens of thousands of readers who love your genre. It's exposure that's hard to find any other way. You can even choose a ready-made promo stack that includes multiple promos over a short period of time to help boost your title's rank on retailers like Amazon. The best part? Scheduling your promo only takes five minutes and comes with world-class customer service. Over 30,000 authors trust Written Word Media with their book marketing. See why at writtenwordmedia.com today. So I really enjoyed talking to Andrew. Uh, Jack Reacher is such a larger-than-life character, especially in terms of like nobility, always doing the right thing. So I was fascinated to hear from him. How, when you have a main character like that, do you design other characters so that the reader feels like they need killing? <laughs> like that's justified. Do you have like tricks that you use, um, you know, to be like the reader's like, yeah, that person needed to die. And they feel okay about that when you have noble characters. I, I don't know Andrew that well, but I know Lee is very, very good at crafting these kind of things. And I'm sure he probably played a big part in creating at least the characters behind each of these these stories. You know, the Jack Reacher character is it kills me because it is such an incredibly good idea. I mean, you can literally take Jack Reacher and drop him into any particular yep. scenario and write a book about it. You could Jack Reacher could go to space tomorrow and people would buy that. You know, he could be at Disney World solving a murder and people would buy that like yeah it's a detective novel you know to take into the 11th power because it can take place anywhere it's just all about the character um you know and that speaks a lot and a lot of the secondary characters you know it, it, it's funny i'm reading one of the older lee, uh, lee child books um and and like he doesn't even name the the actual bad guy until you know like way into the book um but all the actions of that person just really speak to who they are and he's just he's so good at, at crafting that kind of thing and it's clearly rubbing off on his brother yeah so speaking of his brother that was something that was really interesting for me to hear from him because i kind of asked you know how is your solo author voice because he had written many books before writing uh with lee how was that different than writing with lee and he's like well i had to change it So I didn't sound like him because we kind of write similar, which I thought was interesting. And, uh, you know, for anyone, but especially you, J.D., when you're trying to write a James Patterson book, do you find like your voice is different than you're writing by yourself? And what does that look like? The funny thing is we've had I had a conversation with him about that because I, I purposely don't change my voice when I'm writing with him. Um, and, and the only reason I don't is because we I get equal billing on the cover. Um, you know, so it's a kind of a slightly different scenario than some of his other co-authors. You know, like they, people go into a book that he and I wrote together expecting the two authors' voices blended together. Um, you know, because I, 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 you know, being autistic, like one of my, I call it a superpower because I don't know how else to describe it, but like I can read a particular author and I can mimic 
that author's style. Um, you know, picked up their word choice, their cadence, that kind of thing. And I could, I could duplicate it. Um, he always, you know, at the beginning of this, he gave me a hard time because I wasn't doing that with the titles that I, I was writing for him. Um, that being said, if I were to write something with them where, you know, it wasn't equal billing, where it was, you know, 80% of James Patterson book, I, I could definitely do that. Um, you know, and I, I did it with Dracul. I mean, I used Bram Stoker's voice throughout that entire book and rather than my own. And what do you think, like, what's different in, in your voice than in like some of the other books that you've done? Can you describe that? Or is that like a really difficult thing to describe? Um, yeah, I mean, it's, it comes down to word choice. Um, you know, like the, my vocabulary is going to be different from my co-author's vocabulary. And if you're trying to mimic them, obviously you need to know what their vocabulary yeah. is. Uh, their, their cadence, you know, like the, you know, the, the number of words that they put in a particular sentence, you know, the types of sentences that they use, um, you know, it could be little things, you know, like, um, you know, Lee Child loves to have clip sentences, um, you know, rather than using a comma, he'll throw a period in there. I, I don't think there's a single semicolon in any of the Jack Reacher books. Um, those are the kind of things you, you need to pick up on. And, and funny enough, I mean, I, I know I bash AI quite a bit, but like AI can help you analyze these sort of yeah. things. You know, if, if you wanted to compare two writing styles together, um, I, I think it could probably help you pick apart, you know, what, you know, what's different. Yeah, that is that that's a good point, by the way, the that's a use for AI. Um that I think a lot of authors could actually benefit from because it, it not just if you're trying to co-author with somebody and try to make your stuff sound like theirs, but kind of getting a bead on how what your voice is, you could actually drop your stuff in and have the AI help you analyze that to figure out where you're strong, where you need a little help or whatever. So it's, it's a useful tool. Isn't that what uh, AutoCrit does? You can yeah. type in, you know, it's like like James Patterson voice or whatever. So that that's AI generated, I'm sure. It, it is to a certain extent, but they, what they're looking for is, um, you know, we take adverb for for example. It'll it'll say X percent of a JD Barker book is adverbs, and then when you upload your book, if you're comparing it to one of my books, it'll say, well, you're at this percentage, JD oh, Barker's okay. at this percentage, and it'll try to help you. So it it kind of targets along that front. I, you know, I, I wouldn't be surprised over the next couple of years if it doesn't get you know fine tuned to to go lean more towards what you just mentioned. You know, something that could try to mimic, um, which I I don't know would be a good thing. Do you think how important do you think it is? I mean, because if you are co-authoring with somebody, shouldn't there shouldn't it be more of a blend of your voices? I mean, I know the readers are going to want to read a James Patterson book, but, you know, maybe. Well, yeah, no, no, absolutely. And here, here's another example of that. So Michael Crichton's wife, you reached out to, to Patterson, I guess, a year and a half, two years ago now at this point. Um, but she had found about 150, 200 pages of a book that he started and never finished. Yeah. And the outline was there for the remainder of mm. it. Um, so she worked out a deal with, with, with Jim and he ended up re writing the rest of that book, which I think comes out um, maybe late this year, early next year. Um, but, you know, like he purposely went in there, you know, writing in Michael Crichton's yeah. voice, you know, because he was you know, following on the words that were already there, you know. So in a case like that, you know, you know, you got one of the biggest authors in the world. He's basically put, you know, muting his own voice in order to to get the job yeah. done, um, you know. So I, you have to weigh it, I think, per project. That's a good point. Yeah, yeah. I think that's what, like, what you said depends who you're trying to write. Like, if you've got a big name um, that you're trying to write, like, or if you're, you know, just two co-authors like I do, we kind of have a, a blend voice that's neither of ours, which is fine too. Um, I thought it was interesting when Andrew came in. I think he came in at book 24 or something. He read all the books and he made a spreadsheet to keep continuity of like setting things that have already happened. So for anyone who's written a long series, I'm curious if you have any tips for like how to keep track of what you've done and how to keep continuity. I do it through Scrivener. Um, you know, so like when I wrote the 4MK series, when I would start the next book in the series, I copy the characters from the previous one and the, the locations from the previous one, just dump them into the new one. Um, and I, and I always add stuff to those, you know, stuff I particular, some characteristic about a character that, you know, I add maybe in the second or third book, I'll dump it into that character sketch. So it's always yeah. there moving forward. Um, I, I think that kind of thing is useful. Uh, I can't imagine jumping into a series of 24 books deep. I mean, like right now I'm writing in another book in the 4MK series, I had to go back and reread and, and you know, the, the original three just to make sure I got the story straight. Yeah. And that's, you know, it's three books, you know, 24. I mean, that, that's why he had to do that. I think he had to create those detailed notes to really wrap his head around it. And he, you know, he mentioned that Lee remembers all this stuff. And I, I'm 
totally sure that's correct. I mean, Lee, Lee has got a phenomenal memory. He probably can quote half the stuff, you know, from books that he wrote, you know, one, two, three books in, into the series. Like he remembers all of that. Um, but if you're stepping in and trying to fill an author's shoes or, you know, working with them, that's, that's, yeah, a whole that's, other that's where I think, uh, an AI would come in really handy is to help generate a sort of wiki about, about yeah. your book and character breakdowns. That's what I'm looking for out in the world. <clears throat> um, I keep a, so for each series, I write, <clears throat> I have an Apple note right now. I'm going to do better. I'm going to figure out a better solution to this, but like, you know, the Kotler books, I have this massive, uh, Apple note. And basically it's like, I have a, uh, the title of one of the books and then a breakdown of every character that's in that book. And a short, a short synopsis of like what their role was, what happened, that sort of thing. Plus locations, items, you know, whatever it is that's important to that book. Uh, so right now that's all in like bullet lists in a massive Apple note. But I'm looking at things like Notion and Obsidian and, you know, a few other tools that are, you know, real popular with the like uh, the guys on YouTube who are telling you how to be more efficient. You know, Notion is one that, you know, I'm intrigued by, but it's got a learning curve that like, how much time do I want to put into this? But I think if you can put the time in and learn and master something like that, it's going to, it's going to benefit you massively. I'm, I'm kind of looking at that. Obsidian, I think it might be good because it forms connections from the way I understand it. Like you, you can, you know, say for example, you start writing out all the details about all your characters and that can actually help you track connections between characters like this character did this with that character and then that resulted in this thing you know so you know there's i i, I would love an ai to just do all that for me <laughs> well, I, I, i've been playing with um with claude lately playing with uh, claude. which sounds bad sounds like the title <laughs> yeah. of your memoir uh, <laughs> this is claude <laughs> playing with, with claude, claude. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I've been playing with Claude by J.D. Barker. Um, so the, the reason Joanna Penn talks about this one quite a bit. And the nice thing about it as an AI is you can dump up to 100,000 words into oh, nice. it. So you can take a whole novel and you can put it in there. So it can it can create a list of characters. It can create a list of places um, and that kind of thing. It's very useful for that. Um, where it falls short and they all kind of do at this point is they forget. You know, so you can dump that book in there. Um, and like if you're, you know, if you're constant, if you're working on it, you know, like you can start asking it questions, you know, what color eyes does so and so have and things like that. And it, ha it knows the whole book at that point. So it can answer those questions for you. Um, but if a week goes by and you go back in and you want to ask it that same question, then you have to basically retrain it again. Oh, wow. um, unless I'm doing something wrong, you know, which basically means you have to dump the book back in there and you have to teach it all those things. Um, you know, it's very possible I'm not doing it correctly. But like if that's the case, like that's a little extra work for me that I don't really want to do. Um, so if you could dump all that stuff in and it would remember it forever and ever, you know, ideally in like a private sandbox yeah. that nobody else has access to, um, I could see that as being very useful. Yeah, I would want that private sandbox before I'm dumping anything into an <laughs> AI. But yeah, I've been curious about cloud, but I haven't got a chance to look at it. So that's cool to know. Um, the other thing that I thought was interesting talking about, you know, a longstanding series that is much beloved by readers is doing that balance between giving readers what they expect, but also being original. That's a tricky balance. How do you think you can like best pull that off? Um, you know, and Andrew, I, I, you know, ugh, this, th that is tricky. Um, you know, I, I think anytime a character walks into a room, if you expect them to open, you know, door A as their next move, then you should have them open door B, um, just to keep the readers on their toes. I, I tend to try to do that as, as much as possible. Um, you know, Lee, you know, in the, in the initial 24 Reacher books, you know, he's, he's just a very, you know, his presence is, is just there. And like Lee is like that. You know, so like a lot of the decisions that, that Reacher makes are basically Lee's decisions. Um, and Lee is a very strong minded individual. Like, I, I, you know, if you see him somewhere, ask him about the last time he was on Twitter. You know, like he got in a little bit of a Twitter battle with somebody and basically told him to meet them up front in, in front of the building. Like he's ready to fight this individual. And then his publisher said, you're not going to use your Twitter account anymore. And they took it away from him. Um, like he just does not shy away from anything. And, and that, you know, that, that was Lee Child. But, you know, that sounds very much like a Jack Reacher move, you know. I would absolutely go and fist fight Lee Child for just for the publicity alone. Like I would do that just as a way to market my books. <laughs> I would take a dive for it. Well, yeah, I'm pretty sure he wouldn't. Out, he wouldn't please. do it as a way to market his books. <laughs> we'll set that up a charity boxing match with uh, Writers Inc. and Child. Okay. Oh, we can, I'll do it. I will do it. 
Oh, I'll take on any author in the industry. You bring them my way. <laughs> oh, boy. <laughs> okay, and before we devolve into chaos, J.D., who's up next week? <laughs> next week, we've got Mariana Zapata. She's a former indie author who recently signed a trad deal for her latest novel. It's called The Wall of Winnipeg and Me. Um, she also has a very solid handle on TikTok. So at, at last check, she had over a quarter billion views. Oh. That's billion with a B. Wow. Um, I, I really want to hear how she pulled that off. So I'm looking forward to that one. Mariana Zapata. Yeah, can't wait for that one. If you'd like to be notified as soon as new episodes publish, make sure you go to writersinkpodcast.com and sign up now. We'll see you next episode and have a great week of writing. Thanks for listening to this episode of Writers Inc. Access the show notes and leave a comment at writersinkpodcast.com.